Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Mason White. I'm a professor here at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. Um, welcome to Unsettled Lands, Architecture, History, and Technology, part of the Daniels Talk series um, this year. Uh, first, we'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory is the subject of the dish with one spoon covenant and wampum between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Three Fires Confederacy, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources in and around the Great Lakes. Today, the digital space and conceptual place that we're meeting in, as well as the meeting place of Toronto, are still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. While we recognize that not everyone is sharing the same space during this time, we encourage each of you to take the time to think about, learn, and reflect about where you are and the indigenous peoples who have lived there, are currently there, and the future generations who will live there. As people living on this land, it's essential for us to reflect the ethos and respect that the indigenous communities show towards the land and towards each other. We must just support through our words and our action. And now I would like to introduce my colleague and your host today, Mary Lou Lobsinger, Associate Professor. Mary Lou, just checking, are you here with us? I am not seeing Mary Lou. Maybe I'll I'll continue. Um, someone let me know if she drops back in. Um, so uh, joining us today are four um, amazing speakers um, who have been brought together here actually by the Settler Colonial City Project. And the Settler Colonial City Project is a research collective focused on the collaborative production of knowledge about city on, on Turtle Island. Abayala, the Americas, as spaces of ongoing settler colonialism, indigenous survivance, and struggles for decolonization. Trained both as architects and as architectural historians, SCCP co-founders Andrew Hirschler and Anna Maria Leon will discuss the work of the collective as an intersection of practice, research, and pedagogy. In light of current prompts for change in architectural curricula, along with learning from Wayne Yang and Aladia Smoke, they will problematize how institutions have embraced and conflated depoliticized notions of decolonization and anti-racism to raise questions about education and specific to practices in design institutions. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's event. Um, Ana Maria Leon is an architect and a historian of objects, buildings, and landscapes. Her work studies how spatial practices of power and resistance shape the modernity of the Americas. She's co-founder of several churches laboring the, to broaden the reach of architectural history, including the Feminist Art and Architecture Collaborative, uh, Detroit Resists, Nuestro Norte El Astor, and the Settler Colonial City Project. Her book, Modernity for the Masses, Antonio Bonet's Dreams for Buenos Aires, is forthcoming from University of Texas Press in March of 2021. Leon's teachings at the University of Michigan, where she co-directs the Rackham Interdisciplinary Faculty Graduate Workshop, De quote, Decolonizing Pedagogies, unquote. And for the academic year 2020-2021, she's a faculty fellow at the Institute for the Humanities. Uh, joining her in organizing and uh, launching off our event today is Andrew Hersher, her collaborator at SCCP. His work endeavors to bring the study of architecture in cities to bear on struggles for rights, democracy, and justice across a range of global threats. In his scholarship, he explores the architecture of political violence, migration, and displacement, and self determination and resistance. His books include Violence Taking Place. The Architecture of the Kosovo Conflict, Stanford University Press 2010, The Unreal State Guide to Detroit, University of Michigan Press 2012, Displacements, Architecture and Refugee, 
which is actually sitting just over here to my left. Here's a copy of that. Um, 2017 with Sternberg Press and the Global Shelter Humanitarian Ikea Humanitarianism and Rightless Relief, University of Minnesota Press, forthcoming, co authored with uh, Daniel Bertrand Monk. He also co founded a series of militant research collaboratives, including the We the People of Detroit Community Research Collective, Detroit Resist, and the SACP. Uh, Hersher teaches at the University of Michigan, where he also co directs the Rackham Interdisciplinary Faculty Graduate Workshop Decolonizing Pedagogies. And I'll pass the microphone to Mary Lou to introduce Wayne. Apologies for that. I got kicked out, as we sometimes happens in this thing. So it's my pleasure to introduce Wayne Yang. Wayne Yang's work transgresses the line between scholarship and community, as evidenced by his involvement in urban education and community organizing. Before his academic career, he was a public school teacher in Olanese, Olanese territory, now called Oakland, California, where he co-founded the Avenues Project, a youth development nonprofit organization, as well as East Oakland Community High School, which were inspired by the survival programs of the Black Panther Party. An accomplished educator, Dr. Yang has taught high school in Oakland, California for over 15 years and is a recipient of the Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Yang writes about decolonization and everyday epic organizing, particularly from under ghetto colonization, often with his frequent collaborator, Eve Tuck. Currently, they are convening the Land Relationship Super Collective and editing the book series, Indigenous and Decolonizing Studies in Education. He is interested in the complex role of cities in global affairs, cities as sites of settler colonialism, as stages for empire, as places of resettlement and gentrification, and as always already on indigenous land. Shall I continue to? Um, it depends on if my mic is not sounding good. How is it now? It's fine now, yeah. A lady of smoke is, okay, I'll do it. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties here. <laughs> a lady of smoke is a national abbey from Obishikwang, Black Soul First Nation with family roots in Alderville First Nation, Winnipeg and Toronto. Elita has worked in architecture since 2002, founded Smoke Architecture as principal architect in 2014, teaches a big master lecture at, as a master lecturer at Laurentian's McEwen School of Architecture and serves as a founding member of RARC's Indigenous Task Force. Elita, represented Canada at the 2018 Venice Biennale Unseeded Exhibition as part of an international team of Indigenous designers and architects. Current professional work includes community-based and institutional projects, working alongside Indigenous stakeholders, collaborating with First Nations communities and listening closely to our elders. So we've done the introductions then, Mason. So if you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function instead of the chat. Um, you can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will answer questions from Q&A at the end of the event. So now I'd like to hand it over to Anna Maria and to Andrew to start. And after that, we will have Elidia present and Wayne respond. Thank you. Andrew, you're muted. <laughs> Hello. We're very honored to be with you. Honored to have the opportunity to share our work with you 
Honored to be in dialogue with Wayne, Aladia, Mary Lou, Mason, and everyone else who is here. Honored to be able to join you, talk with you, learn with you, and especially at a time when your school is contending with issues that we also find to be urgent and compelling. We'd like to begin by focusing your attention on where we're speaking to you from. I'm speaking to you from occupied territory. Just north of the contemporary city of San Francisco, this is the territory of the Miwok people and the Pomo people, people who still occupy this territory, even as they have been joined by and displaced by many others during two centuries of settler colonialism, a process that of course continues until today throughout the United States, even as dominant versions of US history locate this colonialism far away in the nation's distant past. And I speak to you from the land of the Huancavilca, who still inhabit, live and thrive in this territory ancestrally known as Sumpa, a peninsula in the coast of present day Ecuador. As we live and work in these occupied territories, we recognize the ongoing effects of colonization and colonial state violence. We recognize indigenous sovereignty, and we recognize the struggle for self-determination of indigenous communities across the globe. We also recognize the complicities, double binds, and contradictions that attend to settler land acknowledgements, such as this one. Our work emerges from an attempt to contend with both the possibilities and the limitations of land acknowledgements like the ones we've just shared with you. Acknowledgements that we live as settlers on occupied indigenous land and that we work in settler institutions that continue to benefit from the occupation of that land. The, the work that we'd like to share with you now comes out of the Settler Colonial City Project. And this is a research collective that we founded to, as, as Mason mentioned, produced knowledge about cities in the Americas as spaces of ongoing settler colonialism, indigenous survival and resistance, and struggles for decolonization, as well as to, 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 to try to reimagine knowledge production more generally around decolonized terms, decolonized agendas, and decolonized temporalities. But what are we talking about when we talk about decolonization? Well, following Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang and many indigenous teachers and activists, we, we think about decolonization as the rematriation of land. And following those indigenous teachers and activists, we think about land not just as territory, but also as including the air, the water, the plant life, the animal life, and the human life that sustains and is sustained by each of the preceding. And so we understand rematriation, not just as the return of land to indigeneity, but also as the regeneration of right relations with the land's constituent parts. And so we think that learning decolonization on some level means unlearning architecture, a discipline that amidst all the relationships it avows to politics, to history, to culture, to social issues, to technology, and so much else besides, has been and remains enmeshed with colonialism. But how to learn decolonization and unlearn architecture? Well, what if openings to decolonization would always be latent in architecture, even in its colonial and colonizing forms? What if colonial and colonizing architecture is also an archive of colonial extraction, colonial exploitation, and colonial violence? And what if this archive could be researched, could be read, could be revealed by many means, including via the means of architecture itself? We grappled with these questions as we developed an intervention in the Chicago architecture by Enniel. Our, our intervention was, was focused on the building, the Chicago Cultural Center that you see here where the biennial is sited. This building was built in the late 19th century to house Chicago's public library and provide a headquarters for an organization of Civil War veterans. It's a beautiful and obvious place to site a biennial. 
At the same time though, we also saw the building as an archive of colonialism. And so in our biennial intervention, we annotated those parts of the building where we thought its colonial dimensions were particularly vivid. And we did this to draw relationships between the building's monumentality, its opulence and its civic importance on the one hand and its colonial conditions of possibility on the other. We carried out our project in collaboration with the American Indian Center of Chicago, the first indigenous founded community center in the United States that has members from over 150 tribes who ended up in Chicago after being scattered across the nation during centuries of settler colonialism. And our project was also a collective work done as a team that included Future Firm, Sam al -Man, Emily Kutel, Tyler Shaftsma, and many students from the University of Michigan. We, we started our work with research. This was research on the intertwined settler colonial and indigenous histories of Chicago. And we had a double objective, both of informing ourselves and informing our project. And this research resulted in two publications. The first, Mapping Chicago slash Chicago, brought together a number of geographies produced by indigenous inhab inhabitation and settler colonialism in the place that would eventually become the city of Chicago. And our second publication, Decolonizing the Chicago Cultural Center, summarized our annotations of those parts of the building that most vividly revealed the building's implications in settler and extractive colonialism. And this, this publication allowed our interventions within the building to not only be viewed as part of the temporary biennial exhibition, but also carried out of the building by interested visitors, as well as, as downloaded online, uh, hopefully expanding the reach of our project. And we'd like to show you three of these annotations right now. One annotation commented on the city seal of Chicago, which sits rendered in bronze in the middle of the lobby floor of the Chicago Cultural Center. Upon entering the lobby during the biennial, visitors found, however, not only the city seal on the lobby floor, but also our annotation of that seal on a transparent sign behind it. On its own, Chicago's city seal poses settler colonialism as peacefully replacing an indigenous world. And so the seal depicts an indigenous man calmly watching the arrival of a European sailing ship with a, a sheaf of wheat, a crop brought to Chicago from farms across the Midwest, floating above the 19th century seal of the United States. An infant lying in a shell brings associations of innocence and purity to this scene, while the city's Latin motto below proclaims herbs in Horto, a city in a garden. In our annotation, we pointed out that this so-called garden was a settler space, a space of capital extraction that violently replaced an indigenous life world. We included some of the words spoken by Potawatomi Chief Matea at the signing of the first treaty of Chicago in 1821, when he said to assembled representatives of the US government, if we had more land, you should get more land. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors and we have now hardly enough left to cover the bones of our tribe. And we pointed out how the name Chicago itself comes from a French rendering of one of the indigenous words for a type of wild onion, the Chicaqua, that grew in the pre-colonial forests of the region. And we noted that instead of seeing this indigenous plant on the seal, we see something else. We see wheat, a crop indigenous to the Fertile Crescent, brought to North America by British colonialism and cultivated on the plains surrounding Chicago as this land was seized from Native Americans and transformed into a landscape of extraction. And finally, we reflected on how this seal and its legitimization of colonialism is being slowly erased by solicitous maintenance as the three times a day machine cleaning of the lobby floor gradually wears away the seal's brass surface. In fact, the only objects that are allowed to touch the sole representation of an indigenous person in the Chicago Cultural Center are an eroding floor cleaner and the soles of the many shoes that step on it throughout the day. Small aggressions, we noted, 
that can remind us of a larger pattern of settler colonialism, a pattern of masking the violence of erasure under the guise of civilization. Another annotation commented on the interior design of the Chicago Cultural Center by Tiffany and Company, a world-renowned American jewelry and design company. Tiffany designed and crafted the building's extensive mosaics and its marble inlays, as well as a glass dome, the dome that you see here that was and remains the largest Tiffany built dome in the world. This work is celebrated as one of Tiffany's most sophisticated architectural achievements, but it's also a work that was only made possible by settler colonialism. We told the story of Tiffany's relationship to settler colonialism by annotating the entrance to the room graced by the Tiffany dome. And this is a story that documents the ways in which the eminence of Tiffany in the second half of the, of the 19th century came from its investments in the mythical imagery of the noble savage in the wild west frontier. These were investments that took the form of such objects as ceremonial swords that Tiffany made to reward service in the Civil War, the Mexican-American War and the Indian Wars and Smith and Wesson handguns and Winchester rifles that Tiffany decorated and marketed as guns that won the West. After the Civil War, when the concept of the noble savage emerged to legitimize the displacement and annihilation of Native Americans, we described the ways in which Tiffany began to create objects that married supposedly indigenous iconography with white bourgeois taste, sending expeditions to the American West to acquire artifacts from Native American people. Just as Native Americans were being displaced by the gold and silver mining that yielded the raw material for Tiffany's luxur luxurious products, so too was native knowledge and native culture being appropriated and exploited by that same company's designers. And so rewarded by settler colonialism, we propose that Tiffany and company in turn rendered settler colonialism beautiful. Yet another annotation reflected on the location of the Chicago Cultural Center at the threshold between occupied and unceded indigenous land. This threshold is effectively Michigan Avenue, one of the principal streets in downtown Chicago, which used, which used to mark the edge of the city with Lake Michigan. Today, Michigan Avenue is blocks away from Lake Mich Michigan. This is because from the 1870s onwards, a series of landfilling operations took place to respond to the extensive sedimentation of Lake Michigan and to deposit the large amounts of rubble left in the wake of the 1871 Chicago fire. None of this filled in land existed in 1833 when three indigenous tribes were forced to cede the land on which the city of Chicago would be founded to the United States government. In 1914, one of those tribes, the Potawatomi, filed a lawsuit to claim this unceded land and the case eventually made its way to the United States Supreme Court in 1917. In its decision, the Supreme Court held that the Potawatomi claim to land was premised on its occupancy of that land, an occupancy that ended when they were set to abandon that land in the wake of the arrival of settlers. The court then decided that the Potawatomi claim was without merit. While the Potawatomi formally lost their case, they succeeded in forcing the Supreme Court into an absurd argument that non-existent land could be abandoned. In so doing, the Potawatomi revealed the way in which United States law is structured by settler colonialism, as well as the distance of both law and colonialism from an ethical relationship to land. And this is the result of the research of Potawatomi historian John Lowe um, who was uh, our consultant uh, throughout this work. So what we did was we annotated the windows of the Chicago Cultural Center that looked across Michigan Avenue, this avenue right here. And I'm going to show you these windows right here, uh, looking across the unceded land claimed by the Potawatomi in their lawsuit. By pointing out to visitors that they are standing on occupied indigenous land, and looking at unceded indigenous land, our annotation situates visitors, the Chicago Cultural Center and the city of Chicago itself within the larger processes of settler colonialism that they live within, but are probably unaware of. 
Our annotations thereby invite visitors to see themselves as actors in settler colonialism and to understand themselves as we do as settler participants in ongoing colonial processes. We also organized a series of events in and around the biennial, including an event at the American Indian Center organized with the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative and entitled The Colonizing Architectural Past and Futures. Here, historians of architecture and historians of indigeneity and indigenous historians discussed how to engage with indigenous knowledge, history, and practices in pedagogy and research, as well as how the architectural theories and practices of indigenous peoples might impact the writing of architectural stories and the limits, possibilities, and definitions of archives and even the category of architecture itself. Since this event, we have further reflected on what decolonizing architecture and its histories might entail. As we speculated at the beginning of this intervention, we have come to understand that learning decolonization means unlearning architecture's histories, pedagogies, and institutional affiliations. Curator and filmmaker Ariela Aisha Azoué has powerfully argued that we should unlearn imperialism. And following her lead, we think we should also unlearn the history of architecture. In received versions, these histories, the histories of architecture as structured by the absence of enough attention to colonialism, indigeneity and slavery to force structural changes in the discipline. Before attending to these absences, however, it is worth considering their necessity in the light of their destabilizing presence. These histories reserve historical agency for colonizers. If they do not ignore indigeneity, then they almost always deploy it as a mere foil for colonial modernity, with indigenous peoples posed as inhabitants of a timeless and unchanging nature that, depending on the narrative, colonizing modernities either improve or annihilate. Most vividly, perhaps, these histories do this by simply not contending with indigeneity in the constructions of the modernity they narrate. At the same time, these histories displays the role of racial capital and racialized labor as extraneous to architecture discourse and dismiss the role of enforced, displaced, or migrant labor whose status is based on their adjacency to whiteness. This labor, in turn, Black, Asian, and from indigenous as mestizo, mestizo groups in the Americas has been structured by the displacement of indigenous peoples deprived of their claims to land in other parts of the world. Furthermore, typical histories of modern architecture are oriented around questions of aesthetic form, social function, authorial intention, technology, and political meaning and consequence. In the same way as typical practices of contemporary architecture, these histories do not engage indigeneity, whether it is with respect to issues around land, labor, historiography, environmental epistemologies, or relations of human and non-human life. Examples of this imperialist amnesia include the, constructions of, the construction of canons, the discourse of modernism, the notion of architectural autonomy, and other Eurocentric projects that elide the role of colonialism and white supremacy in their formation. While at least registering the collaboration between modern architecture and colonialism as a theme, more recent attempts at making the curriculum of architectural history more diverse, equitable, or inclusive also serve to advance colonial and colonizing histories by splicing case studies or so-called themes into analytical categories and historical temporalities that are sedimented in colonialism. Consider too on learning architecture in design studio courses, courses in which notions of property and authorship underlie the discipline's colonial mores. Ideas of excellence in studio as in the wider world set parameters of growth established by the colonizer. From professional dialects, through cultural references, to access to the wealth that enables the cultivation of excellence in the first place. Supposedly universal standards of excellence center whiteness and white adjacency over positions based on a rejection of or lack of access to the wages of whiteness. Moreover, when studios engaged so-called other marginal, 
hidden, omitted, or different people's histories or epistemologies, this engagement often operates as a prophylactic, prophylactic inoculation, including the excluded, in order to mark it as secondary, derivative, or not worthy of sustained disciplinary attention. Consider, finally, the institutional reaction to architect to students who, with particular force after the murder of George Floyd, have rightly called out the anti-Black racism and colonialism embedded in their courses, curriculums, student bodies, faculty composition, and relationships with surrounding communities. Many institutions responded to these calls with a series of quick fixes, gestures that were insufficient, ephemeral, and prioritized gestures of solidarity over meaningful structural change. These quick fixes included, for instance, an increase in Black, Indigenous, Asian, and Latin American scholars, conflated not unproblematically under the term BIPOC, invited for talks and short-lived adjunct positions, along with prominent features of students belonging to these groups on websites and other spaces of institutional appearance. The preference for the adjunct hire or the fellowship versus the tenure track position for the, elect, the preference for the elective seminar over changes to the curriculum, suggests that in some cases, we may be going through temporary changes that can be easily reverted. The most widely adopted quite fixes are often oriented around initiatives promoting DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as in the case of our own institution, the University of Michigan. Urgent calls are being made, especially by students for architectural curriculum to be decolonized and anti-racist. At the same time, administrations of schools of architecture are conflating these terms, decolonization and anti-racism with pre-existent DEI plans, projects, and bureaucracies. Conflations that allow white-run and colonially-based institutions to incorporate the appearance of change without changing their power structure, relations to land, and relationships with indigenous and other known white communities. This incorporation disempowers and depoliticizes both decolonizing and anti-racist projects, projects that are often in tension and even sometimes in contradiction with each other. Rather than consume these frictions under the banner of depoliticized inclusion, academia can and should provide the space to discuss and understand these differences. We've learned from indigenous communities and from the indigenous radical tradition that decolonization is first and foremost a political project, a rematriation of land to indigeneity and the constitution of right relations with all of the land's constituent parts. We've also learned from black communities and the black radical tradition that the project of anti-racism is also a political project, action against racism and in particular anti-black racism, as well as actions against the structures that promote and foster that racism. And we've learned that these projects are not always aligned. Scholars of the black Atlantic, for example, have, 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 have theorized the connection of land or this, the connection to land uh, of enslaved African populations derived of their own indigeneity or claims for reparations for black populations may seem to run counter to indigenous claims to land. But maybe it's useful of thinking about decolonizing work and anti-racist work as sharing the work of co-liberation, a concept that might be helpful in understanding how these projects align. As, as we've learned from Tawana Petty, co-liberation is based on the certainty that colonialism and racism don't only dehumanize those who are oppressed, but also those who are privileged, as those privileges rest upon the oppression of others. Here, the path towards co-liberation begins with the acknowledgement of these dehumanizations and the histories of subjugation that they are part of, but it doesn't end there. Co-liberation implies concrete actions, actions that might include unlearning architecture or learning decolonization or placing ourselves in new relationships with the land or new relationships 
with each other. We think that unlearning architecture and learning decolonization each require, among other things, a thorough transformation of architectural pedagogy. It seems to us that a decolonizing architectural pedagogy would necessarily upend the discipline's reliance on property, on authorship, on claims to genius, on celebrated masterworks, on claims of formal distinction, on racialized, underpaid, or still in many cases enslaved labor, on unacknowledged differentiations based on race, on class, on gender, on body ability, and much else besides. Decolonizing the discipline of architecture, it seems to us, would entail challenges to academia's reliance on settler colonialism, on white supremacy, on patriarchal frameworks, and, 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 and developing new understandings of the entanglements of those frameworks with each other. And finally, decolonizing the discipline of architecture might necessitate betrayals of disciplinarity itself, the reliance of disciplinarity on professionalism and expertise and its isolation from or, or its savior relationship to the populations that architecture claims to serve. A decolonized pedagogy might turn instead to the land and to the myriad of ways in which people care for and tend the land. It might retranslate what appears as culture or tradition or heritage from a settler perspective into indigenous epistemologies and ontologies of the land. It might recognize or even recognize the many forms of labor that are involved in tending the land. And it might honor instead of ignore the care and the time and the materials required of this labor. We live and we labor in a colonizing racist and capitalist world. And attempts at decolonization might seem at once urgently needed, but also unreachable or utopian. This dilemma easily resolves into impulses to give up on or rationalize the impossibility of decolonization or avoid action for fear of acting improperly. But colonialism depends on and thrives upon these impulses. Could we be mindful and careful in our actions without veering into hesitation, neutrality, and paralyzing positions that render us complicit with the violence of colonizing white supremacy? Could we push against the colonizing, racializing, and extractive forces at the root of architecture to teach, learn, and build another architecture for another world? With these questions in mind, we look forward to learning from Eladia and Wayne, as well as from all your thoughts and insights. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much. So, Eladia, can we share your screen? Yes, happy to. I just wanted to thank An um, Anna Maria and Andrew for their thoughts. Um, it's gonna change what I'm showing you a little bit because I wanted to respond to some of the thoughts that you shared um, surrounding uh, directly taking those uh, colonial uh, precepts on head on. Um, so let me share a few things with you, I, things that I find exciting. Um, so here we go. Uh, first off, I would like to say, um, So I'm a lady of smoke, um, and my Anishinaabe name means she's quick, which is good because I'm going to cram a whole bunch of stuff quick here. <laughs> And uh, my, my clan is White Wolf Clan. I'm from uh, Laxal First Nation originally. And uh, that's near Sioux Lookout, Ontario, way up north in Canada. Uh, and uh, my family is also I've got on my dad's side, east of Toronto um, in Alderville First Nation. And then on my mom's side, I've got family in Toronto and Winnipeg. So that's me, if you're curious who I am. Um, so I'm just going to share with you uh, this exciting project that I was a part of. Um, 
together with um, my very good friends, uh, Wanda de la Costa and David Fortin, and an elder who guided the process, Win Winnie Pitawanaquat, and then of course our, our wonderful team uh, who worked on this with us. So uh, this is Indigenous people's space, and I'm going to just show you very, very quickly uh, the ideas that were shared here. Really, this was a concept design. It's not a finished product at all. Um, Assembly of First Nations is hosting this on their website. This is directly across from the parliamentary precinct in the capital city of Canada, which is Ottawa. And uh, this was this building was gifted to Indigenous peoples of Canada. Um, and it's uh, a difficult gift to accept because it's a heritage building done in the Beaux-Arts style uh, that cannot be modified on the exterior or really on the interior. And we're supposed to make it into an indigenous space. So how does one do that? So Winnie said, wrap it in a blanket because we want to honor that gift. So the principles we used are here. Uh, first, we established a nation to nation access uh, across from the parliamentary uh, precincts um, a centennial flame honoring the 150th birthday of Canada. So we have an eternal flame here, a time immemorial flame across the street from it in the vacant lot that wasn't in, incidentally not part of the gift. <laughs> the vacant lot was not the gift, the colonial building beside it was. So uh, difficulty, difficulty. So um, we just sort of took over the vacant lot in the concept design because it's concept. Um, we wrapped the colonial building in a vitrine because it's a museum piece, a history of how we used to deal with each other. Um, we uh, modeled that vitrine on the principles of uh, wigwam, uh, which is the regional architecture from this place. Then we wrapped that assembly space in a blanket. The blanket reached out across the land and embraced it. This blanket is a living blanket that's uh, um, adorned with regalia, which comes from physically other communities throughout Canada and a continuously changing exhibit of artisanal works from our home communities so that those communities are physically present here directly across from the parliament building. Uh, we re represented our principles in uh, English, in uh, French, and in Anishinaabemowin, which is the language of this place. Now, the way that we got to um, a response like this is one that I wanted to share with you because I, we follow um, in, my, in my practice sort of a regular uh, sequence of events that I've found to be very effective in introducing narratives that enrich architecture. I believe it could be used um, to enrich any shared initiative to reestablish that connection to place, to reestablish indigenous agency in decisions that affect our territories and to enhance well-being uh, across our uh, human effort. Um, because when we have indigenous knowledge that's been developed throughout time immemorial, it comes with it a knowledge of how to be healthy together, how to be strong together, and how to share our knowledge uh, in a really effective way. So Indigenous leadership entails uh, recognizing the truth and Re reconciliation calls to action. So this is a document that was um, done through a commission uh, here in Canada. And those calls to action are meant to uh, create a roadmap on how to create a reciprocal relationship with Indigenous peoples, a way forward, uh, a, a sort of a, a roadmap to the future. Um, we, we address those calls to action through active consultation dialogue um, that involves culturally appropriate protocols that leads to a design that is in its essence, a constructive communication between uh, stakeholders, advisors, um, indigenous voices of the territory that honors and enacts indigenous sovereignty and agency. This is a sequence of events that we follow uh, to establish leadership uh, that, that has an indigenous um, perspective. So step zero is not listed here. And that's who are we talking to? Because step one is to figure out who speaks for the territory. Um, so step one is to uh, 
play on any existing relationships that the project or the initiative may have uh, with local Indigenous people. Uh, bring those people to the table and then ask them who's missing. Sometimes uh, the project or the initiative comes with an advisory council already formed. It's always important to double check that even if there is an Indigenous advisory council formed for a project or initiative, you double check that voices aren't missing, that there's no one left to invite, <laughs> because we want to have all of the voices present who are critical to bringing those viewpoints forward to the benefit of the project. Then we draft engagement tools and questions that are meaningful. So the meaningful questions is very critical when we're doing consultation or asking questions about initiatives that we're about to enact. We want to make sure that the questions can that the questions we're ask, asking are not already answered. <laughs> so this is really important to the integrity of the process because we want to make sure that all of the answers we get, we can actually act on them. Uh, then we also want to make sure that the way we are asking those questions works for the participant group that we've um, identified. So the way that we ask these questions is something that um, in elicits dialogue. Uh, it spurs people to action and it kicks off those long term relationships that hopefully the initiative or the project is going to uh, start to welcome and engender in that space. So uh, supporting client direction. So make sure that the engagement happens with the blessings of the project leadership. So whatever initiative you're undertaking, the project leadership has to be on board and they have to be present during the engagement process. Uh, we also want to identify as the engagement goes on actionable items, things we can really actually move on. So these are often simple things that um, we can immediately put into put into practice. So um, for my firm, of course, it's, it's design because I, I run an architectural firm. And so those are design directives for me, but this applies to anyone. Um, so that uh, brings me to the reporting back process. So make sure that you say back to the participant group, this is what I heard. Um, because sometimes there's a miss, miss, missed items in translation, um, sort of we use a different language in certain disciplines and our participants are speaking in the languages uh, that they're most familiar with and there's not always a, a cohesive message. So we want to report back and every time you present back the progress of your initiative, make sure that you're saying here is what I heard, this is how we're directly responding to that, is it right? Um, so what I call this process is uh, Ashkabewis, or helper. So Ashkabewis has um, a connotation of assisting a knowledge carrier in bringing that knowledge to the community. So um, it's really critical that as we act as this messenger, we are in a helper position. That is not our knowledge. It's not ours to take home and, and own. It's knowledge that we are uh, that we are allowing to flow through us benefiting from our professional uh, expertise and enacting in our communities. Um, so who is being asked? Job one, what is being asked? What are meaningful questions? How are we asking those questions so that participants can, can access those questions meaningfully? Here's what I heard, is it right? And specific directions, what really matters to this initiative? And then finally, the design responses in my case, or in the case of uh, other initiatives, the responses and actions that you're going to um, enact in, in your project. I just want to show one more thing. I haven't been looking at my time. I'm sorry if I'm going over. This is a wonderful little um, example of an Indigenous uh, curriculum effort that we did in design studio at McEwen School of Architecture. Uh, first, I went and saw Josh Eshkakagan, which is, a, he's an elder who teaches at Kinshgewen Teg in Chigin um, First Nation, which is on Manitoulin Island, uh, which is close to Sudbury and uh, in Georgian Bay. And uh, he showed me this wonderful teaching lodge that they built over the course of a number of years with staff, faculty, and students at uh, this post at this secondary uh, school. So we wanted to build one. I wanted to ask him how it's done. It's an amazing structure. 
we have only just started really. Uh, this is uh, Joey Lynn Wabi, who is a driving force uh, from the Faculty of Social Work. And I love this photo of her in her ribbon skirt and her sledgehammer. And then we uh, partnered with Atikamek Sheng First Nation. And um, uh, this is Art Patatagus here and Julie uh, Pegamagabo in the background. And they showed us how to go out and harvest uh, maple saplings to create a bentwood structure, which the students put together in the central courtyard uh, at Laurentian University's uh, main campus. Wow, that was amazing, Aladia. Um, Mary Lou, should I just jump in? I'm taking that as a yes. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Wayne Yang, and um, I'm zooming in from uh, Kumeyaay Territory, which is also known as San Diego, California. Um, and I'm the only non architect on the Zoom, so I'm very humbled to be here. And I um, we'll keep my comments short um, with a few questions and they're authentic questions in the sense that I really um, don't know enough about this uh, subject that I would love to learn from y'all. So I do have some pictures just to distract from my face. Um, and so here they are. Um, these are some images from Kumeyaay territory. And if you uh, probably will notice that there is a uh, border wall here because this is the Mexico-US border. And this is border actions that the Kumeyaay and other um, indigenous people and allies have been holding um, throughout the pandemic um, to uh, stop the building of wall on sacred land. Um, this is um, sort of a 17, uh, well, right here, 1769 map of Kumeyaay territory uh, per the Spaniards. Um, and you can see it crosses across the, the current um, international border. Um, so I hope what I have to say today is in right relationship to this land and um, the land of Tocoronto as well. Um, I um, decided to frame my comments with this, this, uh, this is actually a question, you know, what, what might the university yet do to indigenize, decolonize, or otherwise architecture. And you can tell I just like the rhyme. But in, in one of my questions is, um, you know, what is the relationship between indigenizing architecture and decolonizing architecture? Um, and what are the differences and um, other, otherwising architecture, I guess I'll say. Um, I, some of the questions that came up to me um, in Ana Maria and Andrew's um, paper was, you know, what space does annotation make possible? Um, and what, um, but what are the things that maybe go beyond, uh, annotation seemed like a step to interrupt. And so what comes beyond that interruption? And I felt like um, Aladia really got into um, indigenizing architecture. And because we're, um, university is not the most important thing, but because that's where we are right now, I thought I should ask what can a university do? Um, I, I want to draw from a couple of uh, inspirations, and, and here's one is uh, Winona LaDuke, who is at the White Earth Reservation and is an economist. Um, and uh, she talks about this idea of the Wendigo and Wendigo e economics or Wendigo infrastructure. And for um, those probably are fami more familiar than I am with the Anishinaabe concept of the Wendigo, which is a creature, perhaps a human, perhaps not who um, has cannibalistic tendencies and essentially takes and eats without being satiated. Um, and I heard um, Winona LaDuke say, takes without apology and without giving thanks. And as you can imagine, this is a metaphor for capitalism as we know it. Um, and in the expropriation extractive nature of capitalism that never ends. And that is what is toxifying the planet and um, killing the plant and animal kingdoms, um, as well as ourselves, the humans. Um, but another thing that um, Winona LaDuke says is that infrastructure, even though it has built, been built this way to do this destructive extractive work, um, and I'm trying to connect this to architecture, which again, I know only so much about, um, infrastructure is not necessarily violent. And, and if you read in this abstract with her Deborah Cohen's work, um, infrastructure is not inherently violent. It is also essential for transformation. A pipe can carry fresh water as well as toxic sludge. Um, another model or blueprint or metaphor for capitalism um, 
uh, that Catherine McKittrick, drawing from Sylvia Winter, talks about is the plantation. And um, here's a quote from McKittrick, which is, the plantation is a persistent but ugly blueprint of our contemporary spatial troubles. And she talks about how the plantation is not just um, you know, the land and the, the agriculture, but it's a whole infrastructure of the big house, the factory, the warehouse, the auction block, the, the trains, the roads, the, the shipyards the, um, that connect to other cities and other markets um, that import and export people, animals, and products. Um, this is a uh, image of, the, of a Butler Island plantation um, that, uh, that, anyways, we don't have to go into that detail. Um, what's interesting about the relationship between plantation and architecture is how the plantation is um, preserved. It's a preserved form of architectural um, genius, if you will, uh, for settler colonial genius uh, of expro expropriation. And um, it represents the, um, the way that settler colonialism at least was initiated at multiple points in time throughout the Americas through the plantation economy, which involved both the seizure of indigenous land um, and the genocide of indigenous people, but also the enslavement of indigenous people from um, particularly from Africa through the Middle Passage, but through the Caribbean and enslavement of indigenous people from the Americas them, uh, themselves, right? Um, and so the plantation really represents the contemporary problems of settler colonialism that we see, um, that we sometimes think of as this, uh, you know, the quote unquote settler colonial triad, the uh, relationships between settler, um, native, and enslaved person. Um, that still twists our relationships today. And so I think that Andrew and uh, Ana Maria's paper, were, they were really talking about how do we undo or unsettle these relationships as well as undo, unsettle and undo the plantation, if you will. Um, and yet Catherine McKittridge and Sylvia Winter talk about this idea of the plot. And um, they're, you know, Sylvia Winter is a philosopher, uh, a Caribbean philosopher. And the plot has multiple meanings for her. So one is the idea of the master narrative, um, which I'm not gonna get into. So the idea of the plot as a story, the story of settler colonialism, if you will, the story of the plantation. And the plot is also a physical piece of land. And in particular within the plantation, the plot as the parcel of land where the impossible was made possible, which is how to enslave people um, sustain themselves under this, with under this bare life um, that was only meant to give them enough uh, shelter and food to continue to serve the plantation. And yet within that, you have the actual growth of narratives, food, cultural practices um, that materialize the deep connections between blackness and the earth and foster values that challenge systemic violence. So similar to um, how Winona LaDuke thinks about um, indigenizing the economy, that um, that Windigo infrastructure isn't the only infrastructure and isn't, isn't the only way infrastructure can be repurposed uh, or purposed. Um, McKittrick does this really provocative statement where she says, you know, the plantation is also what contained a black future. And um, I think that's that's still hard for me to, it's very challenging for me to think about, but, um, but within that, this idea that capitalism is not the total story. Um, here's a, an image of um, a sculptural art piece that is uh, the Brick House, which is now on the High Line in Manhattan, which if you've been there, you can Google the pictures of, but this is in production and this is by Simone Lee. And what I, what I really appreciate about this is how it gestures towards this idea of, uh, um, this called the Brick House, which refers to this architectural shape of the black woman um, in providing impossible shelter, impossibly strong shelter against the the terrors of um, plantation life and, um, and everything that has happened since and before, I guess, so along with the Middle Passage um, and how it's being built within this brick house within Philadelphia, within um, white supremacist America. And um, I thought that was very representative of uh, sort of McKittrick's and Winter's point. So um, I wanted to tie this to architecture somehow in my comments, and I had the great pleasure of speaking to Lisa Loco, who you may know was the um, recent, most recently a Dean of Architecture at CUNY and a Scottish Ghanaian um, architect and novelist and educator who's founding the African Futures Institute in Ghana and Accra. And um, I, this gets to the university because here's somebody who took an administrative role in university more than once. 
and is always starting up new things in university. And I was uh, really amazed by a sort of um, what I naively thought was optimism. But when I, speaking with Lisa, I realized uh, or learned from her that it is really just an analysis that, that universities are permeable and universities are not totalizing forces. They're, they're like the pipes that Winona Duke was talking about. And, um, and also operating from a Global South perspective. So, so uh, Lisa Loco is founding this African Futures Institute in, in Ghana, but had also worked in, in a South Africa setting during the Roads Must Fall campaign. Is um, she pointed out that, you know, in different univer universities are different, and in, in some, from, from her perspective, are actually there's a lot that is possible because they have not, they've, they're not so fixed in in um in their emplacement in power i guess and uh what's interesting about african futures institute is they that she's she and they are connecting um two things in the curriculum which is decolonize decolonizing and decarbonization De so decolonization decarbonization um and it's really quite a radical concept that this is something an institution could do decolonize and decarbonize in this time um Here's a wonderful um, article by uh, Lisa Loco where she talks about the Zulu term for architect, um, Unkambi Wasino, which um, means three things in no particular order, according to uh, Loco, which is magician of space, maker of a situation, or maker of a sensation. And we think about applying this to indigenizing or decolonizing or otherwisezing architecture um, that maybe. Um, and this is a really a question, maybe architecture is something to be unlearned, but also to be um, perhaps redesigned and relearned. And I think that to me connects what Aladia was talking about as well as Anna Maria and Andrew. So um, a couple, uh, I'm gonna end with a few things that I that I want to prop up and, and um, give a shout out to that are efforts that are university, um, related <laughs> efforts. So this is um, Renee Bird, who is a university professor in Northern California and has been working on this thing called Earth Seed Laboratories for quite some time um, um, and has been working on land projects. So really working to, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of Earth Seed, that's an Octavia Butler reference, uh, the, the speculative fiction writer and founding a, um, a place um, that honors and works with indigenous communities, but also provides um, an abolitionary space to practice pro-blackness um, or anti-anti-blackness, if you will. Um, and this is the, the plot um, that Winter and McKittrick talk about, only now not the small plot within the plantation, but a black future. Um, I, and the last thing I wanna end on is, uh, talking about some of our work at San Diego. So I'm at the University of California, San Diego. Um, this is an image of the territory. This, this land is called Makulahui, uh, which means uh, the place of the, the holes or the referring to many sea caves that actually the Kumeyaay um, is a very special place for the Kumeyaay, let's just say. Um, and Indigenous Futures Institute is actually the brainchild of several um, very uh, new emerging scholars and professors at UC San Diego. There, there's quite a few people involved, but so I'll just name a few. Um, first, I'm going to mention uh, Manuel Schwarzberg Carrillo because uh, he is a professor of architectural history and a former architect and designer and also a former student, I think, of Ana Maria and Andrew, who's now at our university and is working with us. But but the, the principal people behind this are um, Professor Kalu Fox, who is a Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiian genomicist, um, who works on bringing genomic technology to a Pacific Islander, indigenous and um, uh, black and people of color communities so that communities can ask their own questions of their genomes and um, ideally come to um, control that data themselves. So, so he has a TEDx talk on genomic sovereignty um, or data sovereignty. And the other um, main collaborator, I would say, and um, organizer behind this is uh, Professor Teresa Stewart Ambo, who is um, uh, Pawicha uh, Luceno um, um, Tongva um, and Tahona Otom. And she is uh, working on thinking about 
how higher education can be accountable to indigenous communities. All this to say is these are examples of, I think, what is may yet be possible um, with the university if we think about as a pipe that can carry fresh water as well as oil. Um, and um, I think I'm just going to end there. Um, thankful for this opportunity to uh, to talk with Eladia, Andrew, Ana Maria, um, Mary Lou, and Mason. If you want to um, unmute yourselves and turn on your your cameras. Thanks so much for for um, including me in this conversation. Thank you. Thank all of you. This is this is amazing. It's it's. It's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. But the, the really great thing is that you're offering not just Vanguard's futures, but actually substance in very different ways. And I think that um, from what you just finished off with examples of the university and not just some monolith that cannot be dealt with, examples of how to actually start to approach a project, how to listen and to understand what the um, what is needed or wanted to ask that question. And then um, stepping back to your projects, to Anna Maria and Andrew, to um, the work that you did in, at the Chicago Biennale and then outlining um, in, in a way that is a way that someone like me would understand in academia. Well, we have history theory and it usually does this job for decolonizing whatever. And then there's studio and then there's the committee or something. So we've got a lot to, to to much on here. Um, I would say also to Wayne, um, the two essays, Deborah Cohen's, we did in a class I did today. <laughs> and I could begin with the student's response there. It's, it's so abstract, it's so big, but they did come back to the infrastructure can be a pipeline to something else. And we started talking about pipelines of relationships. So unlike a university, which seems monolithic, or you're in a class, or you're in architecture, or you're trying to get into architecture, that if we could break it down to the things you can, if not control, reason with in your immediate, that if we could begin to work that way. And I know it sounds, it was, it's interesting to try to talk about that with in a faculty of design where there's a lot of pressure to get the grade, move on. You know, this is a time of year, all that is happening. And also alongside that comment, if I could stick with that, is a student said, this is so abstract. It's just so abstract with the ideas. So one of the really great things in each case, of, and I hope we can talk more specifically is that, for me, is each one has put in a piece that makes it less abstract. Um, I don't really have an opening question. I have that summary um, in some way of my own enthusiasm from it. Because um, we could, you know, I could go back to the beginning um, presentations. We say, what do we do about precedents in that kind of teaching or the generations of mentorships? that happens through education in, especially in schools of architecture that are translated through institutions. Um, but- uh, maybe I'll, I'll chime in a little bit as well, Mary Lou. Um, really inspiring uh, talks by um, all four of you and the, the three different approaches. I love this idea of the sort of parallel projects. Hopefully my mic is, is better now than it was at intro. Okay, good. Um, um, I, I was thinking about each of you spoke to alternative approaches to the term architect or even architecture. Um, I heard Andrew and Anna Maria refer to the idea of transforming pedagogy and um, unlearning notions of property uh, authorship. Um, I heard uh, Aladia speaking about this idea of the Oshka Buis, the, the helper, um, this really powerful idea of, um, or even I think, uh, Aladia, you spoke to this idea and it was, it, it seems so obvious and it's something that I think there's even the phrase of it, the phrase of circling back, right? This is a kind of a colloquia, colloquial way in which to discuss returning back to something. But I think that that minor phrase is so, is said the way you say it with so much more meaning and intent than the way it is referred to almost more in an informal way in meetings. You know, let's circle back to this because processes um, typically are linear, right? Western European 
processes imply linearity. And this circle back is such a genius, powerful notion to rethinking the linearity of that practice. And then Wayne, I, what a powerful notion of the um, maker of a situation, you know, the, the maker of a sensation. I, wouldn't that be a great degree to have, to, be, to have the degree of master of maker of a situation, much better than architecture or architect. So um, I, I feel like each of you are kind of speaking to in this unlearning process, I wonder if it's sort of questioning our very understanding about what this role implies and is, is the pipeline of the university, how could it provide this, um, this platform for unlearning? And, and I, I feel like maybe Anna Maria and Andrew, it'd be wonderful to hear your reaction also to Wayne and Aladia's because we've kind of brought you together and this is exciting for us to hear um, your, your SCCP, SCCP project, which is longstanding before 2020 and you've really been pursuing this for years. So I think it'd be great to hear your um, or you uh, respond to this. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll begin. And, 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 and first to, to thank Eladia and Wayne for, for sharing with us your luminous, your luminous thinking and your luminous working. Um, yeah, we're honored to be in dialogue with you. Um, I, 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 one of the things that, that, that was very foregrounded to me, um, was the roadmap to the future that Eladia talked about has more than one vehicle. Uh, 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 um, or it, it suggests that there's more than one vehicle to, to travel upon it. That is to say, I think to, to be more specific that, that for Anna Marie and I, who are both settlers in a settler colonial university, the, the, the vehicle that we travel to the future, I think is, is, is different than the vehicle of, of indigenous people who, who have a, 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 a different relationship to the land than we do. And, and, I, and that is why we, we've, we've been trying to be very careful uh, uh, that, that about being a settler colonial city project, which is different than being an indigenous city project. That is to say, um, as settlers, in a settler colonial university, we, we've been trying to 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 um, focus on on our, our our settler colonial world, our settler terms, the settler discipline that we occupy, and and to try to, uh, in a sense, dis dismantle it from within, hopefully to make space for our indigenous colleagues to indigenize the the the, the space that's then created. Um, Anna Maria, do you want to do you want to continue or e expand on that? Sure, um, Wayne. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I I just learned so much uh, from these presentations, um, Lydia. I I I felt that um, this sort of the, the, the very rigorous process that you shared with us was, um, was so illuminating in offering pathways to creating conversations with community um, and not rigorously in a way that um, pays attention to listening to all voices and keeping voices in the room. Um, and I was thinking that along with you know, this idea of unlearning architecture uh, comes hand in hand, um, thinking about your presentation with sort of unlearning hierarchies and specific roles that we have been taught, right? Um, from the role of the architect as expert, uh, which um, we, we have been thinking about, uh, you know, and, 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 and that sort of, unsettling um, to other roles of expertise and, and, and increased roles for community. Uh, and I, I, I love the sledgehammer uh, because it also tells me about a, an unsettling of the role of the architect as someone who's you know, separate from the building process uh, and separate from the harvesting process of the materials, right? That are used in the construction. So, um, I, I, I thought 
I, I really appreciate sort of those, um, those um, very specific pathways to um, possibilities, right? Uh, um, on how to unsettle and unlearn this discipline uh, that we're in. Um, and, and Wayne, I, I love this idea. I, I, I would have not expected you uh, arguing for the university uh, because we're both uh, huge fans, of course, of a third university is possible. Um, and, and we've been thinking uh, in, in work that we do at the University of Michigan on ways to extract resources from this first world university um, and reroute them to the third world university. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think everybody's taking up with the pipe analogy also in the chat. Uh, and I, I like, um, I, I, I like the idea that perhaps we can, um, perhaps we can also use universities as good pipelines for water. I was thinking um, the reference to Leslie Loco and and her what her work is as so significant. And I remember um, hearing her speak in the unlearning seminar that was at Cornell. And she said that she asked, why do architects not understand the do no harm? Why do we not take that oath like other like medicine or something? Could that be something that you could begin by thinking and begin to approach? The work differently, do no harm. As an well, ethic, it, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting comment, Mary Lou, because it, it, it you know, I, I, th I think maybe for us, uh, and and I hope this was true in in our biennial project. Uh, one 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 modality of decolonizing architecture is to foreground it, its implications in colonialism and all the harm that that that. Um, it, it is hidden when those implications are, are not attended to. Um, and you know, the, 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 it, it, might, it might be strange. I think it is very strange for someone who, 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 who visits architecture from another, another discipline or another world to find out the way that in, even in the university, where we're teaching and learning architecture, architecture is almost always valorized. And the, 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 the way we critique architecture has nothing, almost, almost always nothing to do with, with questions around um, colonialism. It has, it has to, it has to do with the, with, 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 with the colonial terms of architecture, not, um, it, those those terms those terms don't get critiqued as colonial. Um, they they get critiqued in, in insofar as are they being are they being effectively advanced or not? And I think that's why where the work of of Eladia comes in as 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 a, as an as a other architecture that 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 offers uh, uh, you know other other ways of of, of 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 thinking and doing and undoing the discipline. I was, uh, oh my goodness, I was really inspired by a couple of the points that you were all making. Um, I got super uh, chills actually when you mentioned Winona LaDuke who's totally my hero. Um, <laughs> and yeah, her, her Windigo uh, analogy, I'm gonna have to read that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, um, Anna Marie and Andrew, you were talking about, um, you were just talking about, um, how how we sort of do research uh, given a sort of a colonial context that we're all working in. So we have all inherited this extractive colonial way of being, and it's actually highly entrenched in our philosophical approaches at all levels of society. In fact, it's so entrenched it's become completely invisible. We kind of just take these assumptions for granted. Yes, of course, we're going to extract natural resources. And of course, we're, our job is to transmute those resources into raw materials that 
don't have a life or an agency of their own. And of course, we are going to transmute those raw materials into profit. And that is our job here on this continent. That is not a way of life. <laughs> and so the key is how do we uh, un undermine those assumptions, get to the bottom of them, back to a place where we believe ourselves as human beings to be forces for life, um, that our job is actually to speak for territory. Um, they often say that Indigenous peoples didn't have a concept of land ownership. Of course we did, but the concept was backwards. Uh, we belong to the land. So the territories that we reside in, we belong to that territory and it's our job and responsibility to make sure that territory thrives. And so we, like the uh, elders and knowledge carriers I have spoken with, uh, have never um, spoken to me in a language of how do we mitigate harm or how do we how do we um, how do we mitigate our impacts? That's not the language they use. They uh, they're always coming from the perspective of how do we how do we actually enhance the life systems around us. So changing how we view ourselves as human beings in space is something that I think is the job of curriculum. Um, so never accepting that assumption that our sole goal on this continent as human beings is to take natural resources and make them into raw materials and transmute those into profit. That's not what we're here for. We're here to, to for such a, such a more shining purpose than that. I just wanna share one image with you. Um, this is a, a, um, a teaching space uh, that um, I've designed with uh, Dialogue um, and uh, the builder is Ellis Dawn. So Dialogue is a collaborating architectural firm here in uh, Toronto. And um, we designed this together. So this is uh, one of the core spaces of the building. We sort of call it the heart of the building. So it's the indigenous commons and it's built on the principles of Nami Itawigamig, which is the Anishinaabe roundhouse. This is one word for it, which means this is where we go to dance together. Um, so this is a teaching space, but it's also a multifunctional space that opens onto an interior court or courtyard, which is also an outdoor classroom where traditional activities can be taught in situ. Um, there's a whole bunch of embedded narratives in this architectural typology, which predates contact. Um, so the four columns you see open to the four cardinal directions. Uh, the direction of up is recognized with a clear story daylight that's coming down from above, forming a connection to sky. The direction of down is honored as that sort of direction um, associated with Shkagamakwe or Mother Earth. The direction of center is really important because that's the direction of self or balance. That's where you would put the drum which represents the heartbeat that connects us all together and reminds us of the interconnectedness of all life systems. As you gather in the space, you gather in a circle because all voices are equally contributing to the experience of being here. So the space itself is a narrative of how that pedagogy might unfold. Um, and this was always a space where people would come together to share knowledge and to address issues that affect the community as a whole. So this Anishinaabe roundhouse um, architectural typology inspired the space, but it's also um, a call to action to be different <laughs> in the space. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you. May I ask you a question, Lydia? Yes. First of all, I just want to echo what you said or reflect what I heard, thought I heard you say, which is, you know, just this idea of re, we have to re, learn, we have to learn how to remake the space, but it's really learning by looking, by learning from first principles, right, from, from ancestors, from the land, and, and, and the space itself is a pedagogy, so like when we turn on the water or turn on the gas, like we're learning something, but we don't even know it, like it's that pervasive, and so, so what you're saying here is, making a space so that we can be different, right? We can learn to be different through, from the space. And so I, so I just want to really appreciate that because you tied so many things together. Uh, I want to actually ask you a question that's sort of in the chat. Um, there's a couple questions about, um, I'm gonna just, about time and temporality. And I think people were taken up with this, what you were saying, like this is how we engage people in, in authentic questions and, and, and come back to them with real answers. Uh, 
to, to those questions and update them. And that there's a kind of way in which you have to operate in a different time scale, a different kind of temporality, not colonial time. And, um, and there's a similar question that's like, how do you do that when we're working so much of our lives are dictated by colonial time. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, like your own sense of time working the way that you have been. To who, me? <laughs> is that, who's, who's the question for, is that? For you, yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And it's because they were in the chat, so I've just sort of. Ah, time. Uh, I don't know. I, I always just sort of like take the thing that's closest to hand. That's sort of how I, how I go. Um, when I've, when I've talked to elders in the past and I sort of approach sometimes, you know, before I had a whole lot of experience, I sort of approached whoever I knew was an elder or a knowledge carrier and I'd ask them, okay, I'm doing this thing. Um, like how, how should I do it? Uh, and, um, and they'd always say, okay, so who's involved with this initiative? Um, and I'd be like, okay, so I know that so-and-so is involved with sort of an aspect similar to this. And they just very gently direct me to take the relationship nearest to hand and strengthen that relationship. So um, I guess I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but when you're thinking about time, I guess I'm thinking about like people. <laughs> So time is sort of immaterial. And I think the people who are, who are going to be involved in activities of the space are going to be the most powerful voice, regardless of time. Like the concept of time that I've heard described from our perspective is that it's a sphere and all time is happening contemporaneously. And we are just a point on the sphere. And so that's how what we see, but like all time is happening. So all things that have happened have happened. And are happening and are changing constantly. So time is a sphere and we sort of have picked a point where we're gonna be in our physical existence. And of course there are echoes of all other points on that sphere always. And we wanna listen for those echoes because they'll teach us things. So the way we do that is we speak to people who are involved in this little time that we've chosen <laughs> And they will hopefully hear those echoes maybe better than we can. <laughs> I don't know if that speaks to your question at all. <laughs> can I um, just sort of, um, Aladia, you're just, just wanted to add just one thing because you, you're, uh, when you showed the harvesting of the wood, uh, we, we have an annotation that we didn't show this time in which we annotated the mahogany doors uh, of the cultural center. Uh, and the mahogany comes from South India, but it's actually an indigenous, a wood that's indigenous from the Americas, but it was so depleted by the time they built the center that they had transplanted it and were cropping it in South India. And, and it makes me think of time because you showed wood that was being harvested for, to produce a building Right? And, 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 and the folks that were harvesting it were in, you know, um, took part in the cycle of that wood. And that's a very different cycle than the depletion of a crop from a whole continent and its extraction and, and changing of life worlds in another continent and then an extraction to create beautiful doors uh, to be looked at. So perhaps that's another take also um, on how time can be thought of differently. So uh, R Roberto has asked a couple of times about the city. Um, there were of course pre-contact cities. Uh, they're just farther south than where we are um, because the resource base was more intense uh, farther south, they could have those cities. Um, and that's a way they chose to live. Up here, up north, we chose to live uh, not really in cities. Um, we chose a less dense way of living. Primarily, that's because of the resource base we had to work with. So cities are um, at odds, perhaps, with some of the life systems that support them because they're, uh, they are also founded on extractive principles. So what I would say is we have to find a new pattern of supporting life in the city that is able to support that city um, so that the city ceases to become um, 
uh, a resource sink and instead starts to become uh, uh, you know, a life generator. Um, because the reason people lived in less dense fashion up, up around here is because the, 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 the patterns of life were able to support us in a certain way. And so we just modified the way that we lived to this place. Could I, I, I would briefly just add that, you know, south, sort of north, northeast of St. Louis, you had Cahokia, which was bigger than London when it was um, at its height in the, is it 12th or 13th century? I'm not sure, sorry. Um, and, and much bigger cities or if we, that some, you know, populations that we might call cities um, throughout and before the European arrival. We have to teach them that's the thing. Yeah, I just wanted to echo something I learned from Karina Gold, uh, and uh, who's Ohlone um, from Oakland, California. And, uh, you know, the, the San Francisco Bay Area, she said it's, it's, and this is an, I guess, sort of an indigenous perspective is kind of, you know, you, you learn to live in the place where you are sustainably. And that area is a little bit more abundant. I mean, that it's just what it is. And so they have massive shell mounds that functioned almost like cities. Um, but she said the difference is that everything they built um, went back to the earth. So, so it, the footprint is very, very small, even though, even though the cities could be quite large. Yeah, that's exactly right. I remember Art Patagos, uh, when I first went out to Sudbury, I got, um, I went to an event at Nswakmuk, which is uh, the um, uh, Anishinaabem one term for Sudbury, and it's also the French center. And I just out of the blue met Julia Pegamagavo, and she said, "We're going to go plant rice, uh, Manoman. Uh, did you want to come?" And I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> and so we trucked out in her SUV. I didn't know these people <laughs> to a Tikamishing, and we went to Fly Lake, and we they had some canoes, and we went out in canoes, and we planted rice, Manoman, and. Um, and they sang songs to the rice to, you know, help it grow and welcome it into the new space because they're trying to recolonize the shoreline with rice. And uh, Art Patagou said, you know, this is how we used to do. We used to, you know, we used to make fish weirs, which would help them uh, with their breeding grounds and also serve to sort of catch the fish as well. And then we, the way we picked cranberries, you know, we'd pick them in such a way that the cranberries would grow back stronger the next year. And this is how we did rice, you know, we'd go and and plant the rice every year. We'd hold back some from the harvest and go plant rice. So what he was saying was we're supporting the life systems that support us. So we're making just small gestures to support what's already there, but support it in such a way that it'll support us. And I think that's the way of living that we have to come back to. I wonder, um, I alluded, I missed half of your uh, presentation because my intern went, went out again. So I hope I'm not repeating something you've done. How would, do you, do you work at the scale of planning and plans like, um, you know, the question from Roberto on the city, he focuses on urban design and teaching urban design. And I, I wonder um, if there's some ways thinking around time instead of, you know, user um, maps and things like that, if it, there's some advice on that or some way of thinking around the scale of the city. Probably not planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm doing a community plan right now for uh, Nescapi of Kawawa Chikamach. And so we did a process uh, very similar to what I had described in the presentation. Uh, and we're still gathering information, uh, stories that they're telling about their community and getting a sense of what they need next. And again, it's sort of like interjecting only where you need to. So just very selectively, um, intervening so that you can enhance something that's already there. So we sort of identified this one little shop. They only have one shop on their whole community. <laughs> Everybody goes out to another town to buy stuff. So we're like, okay, so there'll be a little, a new little set of shops over here. And then slowly over time, we'll put another one over here so that everybody can come to the same spot. And then later we'll develop this sort of like little pedestrian mall where you know there'll be like a nice picnic spot where your drainage already exists and we'll make that under a park and so it's just like little interventions and we do this by listening to people's stories 
we also uh, were able to go and visit the community, which was really important and just get a sense of how they live and, um, you know, who feels what about, you know, living close to elders or maybe not, maybe elders need their own space or, you know, you have to listen. And then as those narratives start to reveal themselves, then you can make those little interventions. I think it's being not the big gesture, you know, to completely make a huge you know, view shed down an avenue and boulevard, glorious building at the end, but like, you know, making those gentle interventions to support what's already going on. In, in think, one of, oops. Oh, <laughs> Time is a big deal. I mean, when they plan, they plan for 10 years, right? And it's a perspective and in whether it's urbanism as form or planning um, use for different plots of land in cities. And so I guess that would come back, we'd circle back into, you can't plan time 10 years in advance through city planning. Thanks. The, the, the one thing that I, I, I would add to this, this conversation uh, inspired by questions around, around time and planning, especially listening to Eladia's responses to them, is that I, I think in, in architecture, especially we, we don't have available to us a rich lexicon of terms that support what, what maybe could be called intercognitive epistemologies, uh, terms that to help us move across non-congruent knowledge systems, um, terms to, to help us negotiate um, different and maybe to some degree uh, incompatible temporalities. And it, if, if there is a curriculum to come, <laughs> that that could support, on the one hand, decolonization, and on, and on the other hand, indigenization. Maybe that curriculum ne needs to develop some ways of of of, of moving, accommodate the fact that indigeneity is is entering uh, uh, as a as a kind of a, a object of study to the university, which is a, a settler space and doesn't have. The, the right now, the appropriate terms to really uh, uh, accommodate it. I, the question of language comes up all the time, the reverting back to, or just trying to shift subtly aside, whether it is in discussing architecture and form or the institutional frameworks of it. I'm, we need different words, absolutely, <laughs> different thinking. I mean, I, I was thinking also about um, Anna Maria. I think it was when you were speaking. You you showed Peter Eisenman's house too, and you named the land that it was on. Like I feel like these projects are so powerful in their ability to reveal uh, what is hidden. And and I, I think like the the words in my head are 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 all our words. It's like reveal, resist, and reclaim. I, I feel like I, I'm enjoying. All, I think these as parallel paths. Seem essential. I don't think that one in exclusion of the other on um, the project will prevail. I feel like um, it's very effective to have the settler colonial recognition as a project as you describe it. And I think Andrew, I think quite powerfully stating it, I can sense the humbleness in the words of saying, I'm in a settler space. I'm, in a, I'm, a, I'm a settler in a settler space in a settler pipeline, in a settler infrastructure, and 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 how um, that itself requires forms of resistance. It requires forms of revealing. I see that the project in Chicago is so powerful in its ability to reveal, and I think that 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 project is as essential as I see a lady of kind of trailblazing um, process. I feel like the, the most powerful for me as a someone attempting to practice architect and teach it print and practice architecture and teach it is the way in which it provokes notions of of process um i feel like this is where our language has fails because the singularity of process seems to again privilege authorship it privileges so many other sort of outcomes and i feel like um both the resistance and revelation project of your work andrew and Anna maria and uh, Aledia's project of reclaim um, are parallel uh, approaches that um, are necessary uh, simultaneously. And I think 
for me, Wayne, Wayne really sort of wraps this in a blanket, wraps these, these parallel paths in a blanket effectively by unsettling relationships. I think this is what we will, we will, I know 2020 is a year to forget, but in some ways it's a year to recognize how powerful it was in provoking unsettlement. And it, it seems so necessary. And um, I think this is a really powerful evening uh, that, that we witnessed here. And I'm, I'm glad it's being recorded for future viewing and, and repeated uh, listening and repeated viewing. So um, Maria, uh, thank you to everyone. And, and Mary Lou, I'll maybe pass it to you for uh, wrapping our evening in a further oh. fun blanket. We're at the end. I'm sorry. I was so into this. I'm. I'm. Um, I'd look for my notes now. Well, I'm. I'm saying. Oh, I've got the right here. You, so, get the last I, word. I, you, you know, the last about word. about. Um, oh, I thought I was supposed to read what comes next. Um, so in 2020, people, let's get back to normal. You know when people are calling for that, and I was just like, no, like, and it's not to dismiss the pain around the pandemic or anything like that, but in picking up on on what you said, Mason, it's, it's this kind of a unsettling moment that is possible to open up thinking that's beyond what we think is normal and the drivers of capitalism, which we're seeing everywhere around it. Um, there are some other comments in the um, Q&A that we didn't get to. So, um, there's long lead-ins to them, it, I, if I could summarize on the, the, the concern that how do you do you throw out to do to um, bring in decolonization or to think differently. I'm wondering if you have thoughts as educators about teaching architectural in such a context where there's vernacular, a dominant urban form, an architecture that has most significantly erased traces of prior indigenous occupation. How do you do that? A kind of how to question. And then there's uh, two-eyed seeing and a few other things. But um, sh do we have a few more minutes for this, Mason, I think? I, th I think maybe two more minutes. Um, it sounds like many have already been sitting down for hours and let's uh, let okay. people get on with their evenings. But maybe if you, it, I was I was thinking it was a great chance for a, a summation, um, maybe from anyone. I think Wayne, Anna Maria, Andrew, Lydia, um, just so that we can find some closure here and people can move on with their families and evenings. Okay. I would just say quickly that you 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 take what you have in the place where you're teaching, um, and you you peel off the layers, and and you find you you, you get in touch with the communities from the places where you are, um, and this sense of throwing things away from the past, it's actually looking at them more closely. Um, and, and understanding them better, not understanding them with a narrow view of the ideologies that we have been taught to sort of a very specific frame, but actually opening them up and understanding how they come to happen. I, I mean, to me, what, what comes to mind from that question is the past that's in question here is 500 years, the last 500 years, uh, of colonial occupation, which was preceded by tens of thousands of years. And uh, that past is not yet, it's, it's, not, it's, not, even, it's uh, not yet even under consideration in, especially in schools of, 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 of architecture. Um, so instead, one, one could think about this not as throwing away, but as, as, a, as, as very much the opposite. Um. I'll go next. I, I'm hoping that lady will have the last word. Um, so, uh, but I put in the chat that I, I'm just thinking how there's different tools for different places and different architectures. Um, here, one of the first Spanish missions built in Alta California is in San, San Diego. It's actually San Diego's named after it. And the Kumi, I burnt it down. And I think that was an appropriate response to that particular um, architecture. I think um, I was thinking about Lisa Loco's work in Accra, Ghana, and it's they're building something anew, you know, maybe um, so there's no need to burn it down. Um, and so I'm just thinking about the curriculum in the past in these kinds of ways. And and then I, I what I heard from um, what what your elder um, instructed you to do, uh, Aladia, is to to create bundles, and and those bundles are sort of they're pedagogical, you know, they're messages for future people to read and understand and and maybe that was the appropriate response to a gift even if that gift wasn't exactly the one you wanted right you know so 
that, but I'm just hearing like when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum, there's different tools and even like the interventions in Chicago are different from the interventions um, in, in, in this territory, um, Lydia and as well. So thanks. Do you, do you have final words, Elidia? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> the question is, what are your final words? No, okay. Um, I would say, okay, so a lot of the questions had to do with sort of um, how do we decolonialize curriculum? And how do we teach, um, you know, uh, I guess colonial precedents that were brought over from here, from elsewhere, uh, still honoring, I guess, the value of the work uh, that is historical and apprising students of that work, but in a new light. Um, so I guess what I'd say to all of those questions, which I think are sort of getting at uh, roughly that, I think if I'm understanding the question, questions correctly, is um, we have to look at those historical works um, by uh, addressing the underlying assumptions that that really form their foundation. So, uh, you know, Andrew and Anna Maria, I think your work actually was precisely doing that. It's, you know, taking these historical precedents and taking a look at the, what are the assumptions that are implicit in these spaces and this treatment of space. So even something as simple as, you know, when you look at a Beaux-Arts building, it always lifts itself off the ground. It has this really hefty bottom edge and it's specifically trying to lift itself away from the place. <laughs> and when you look at renderings of them, like historical renderings, you always see no context. It's like, if you're lucky, you get a straight line and that's all you get for context. Um, and that's, an amazing assumption that sort of oftentimes when we teach those precedents goes completely unquestioned. Um, even our, you know, modernist uh, architect, um, uh, you know, precedents, uh, they sort of just, I remember this one from, uh, oh my goodness, Le Corbusier, and he just sort of paved the entire site, paved it completely with a grid of pavers and then plonked his building on there. And the crazy thing is that he said his building was meant to honor the, you know, the sinuous lines that are, that are like a woman's body off in the landscape uh, uh, beyond, you know? But then he paved the whole darn thing and plonked it on as an object. Like how violent is that? What are you, you know, raping this poor woman? Anyways, like you, we have to question the underlying assumptions of those precedents. And yes, they have value and yes, they have depth of thought to them, but also acknowledge that they are uh, built on understandings of ourselves in the world that are perhaps no longer valid and we have to question them. So I would say that's how we teach those precedents, um, you know, not unquestioned. <laughs> and then in terms of how do we move towards a decolonized architecture, or a decolonized curriculum is, I think, connect with the communities where your schools are at, you know? Um, so uh, ask questions. And I know there are some, you know, great initiatives going on where we're sort of approaching communities and saying, what have you got on the back burner? You know, what could our students assist you with? And do you have the time to let us help you? <laughs> so like, how can we move this forward together? So a really collaborative process using some of those initiate those methods that I sort of had outlined, I think are really effective. How would you like to engage? How would you like to see this roll out? What are your priorities? What is critical to make this shared initiative uh, valid and um, constructive and enjoyable and useful. So instead of sort of doing research for research's sake, do it for the sake of whatever your Indigenous communities and your Indigenous partners really want to do. <laughs> Figure that out and help them do that. Do it as a team effort and you will have amazing results. So I guess I'm saying participatory research. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in the language of research or process that is endpoint and a certain argument orientated and that just has to be taken apart. I, we all kind of learn it through our education and we don't even see it, even when we think we're reading something that's challenging it. So I want to thank you all so, so very much for this. It's, 
it's been a real honor and I've learned so much. I've been paying attention, learning. So I want to thank you very much for joining us for this event and for stimulating conversation. And now I have to wrap up and um, um, thank the audience who has been paying attention here and tell them about the next event. And it's actually something that, um, well, it's Timothy Hyde from MIT and he's going to talk about the building site and his approach to the building site is not about the before, which is typical of architects. You go and you have an idea and you look at it and then you skip over the construction and then you show, this is what I did, I responded to it. He is going to be talking about, he's promised to talk about in his new research, the building site Redo, where he looks at the labor and how you can figure out methods to understand that actual extractive process when the digging happens and all that. And so I, I don't know if it actually fits into the um, kind of process of decolonization or that of a building site, but it sounds like it's trying to do something very different than the typical um, architectural history or approach to um, site and design of a site. So I hope everyone can join us for that um, on March 16th. And then after that, we have Douglas Cardinal, who will um, be speaking, walk through architecture March 25th. Um, it'll be a Daniels event. And um, so that's for the audience. And so um, thank you so, so very much. I've learned a tremendous amount. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you. Yes. Thanks. A pleasure to hear the rest of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>